Now we're going to move on to our talk with Dr. Bianco. Dr. Bianco, do you want to go ahead and share your presentation? Uh, um, yes, I will. Just a second. So let me. Sure. Um, while he is sharing, I am going to go ahead and introduce him. Dr. Bianco is professor of medicine at um, University of Chicago. Uh, he has been a past president of the American Thyroid Association and is also the recipient of the 2020 John Stanbury Thyroid Pathophysiology Medal from the American Thyroid Association. He was also the Charles Weaver Professor of Cancer Research, Senior Vice President and Vice Dean of Clinical Affairs, as well as President of the Rush University Medical Group. Dr. Bianco is very modest and wanted a very short introduction, but I do have to say that he has done an immense amount of work, about 35 years in uh, uh, iodothyronine iodo deiodinases, which play a key role in thyroid hormone metabolism and action. And we are going to um, talk about his research today and how it plays into clinical practice. Dr. Bianco, please. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and, and especially for the invitation to speak to this group. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to start with an email that I got from a patient many years ago, which is actually it's not very different from the one case we just discussed. This patient was on uh, th a desiccated thyroid extract. She was feeling well since many years, and then her specific product came off the market, and her uh, physician placed her on levothyroxine, and since the day that she was placed on levothyroxine, she has started with a series of complaints and uh, cognitive complaints, metabolic complaints, and she was asking me to, to put her back on combination therapy. Uh, now, uh, the first thing that I do in these cases is, uh, was this patient really hypothyroid to begin with? Because we, I don't think we can treat symptoms with thyroid hormone if that those symptoms are not originated from the thyroid. So uh, I would I like to check patient's TSH from the medical history. If I'm not sure, I will stop uh, a treatment with levothyroxine for two or three weeks uh, to see if the TSH goes up to levels that justify treatment. And I do this because I find it that, that invariably patients are placed on, on thyroid hormone replacement therapy, but they have no thyroid hormone. Recently, there was a publication in which they found that up to 30% of patients on levothyroxine, maybe a little bit exaggerated, uh, they are not uh, justified. The treatment with levothyroxine was not justified. So second of all, I, I do as all, you read, all this previous case has shown, uh, is there a chronic associated condition that contributes with the symptoms? We have to screen that patient. And I find it that the most common situation is menopausal syndrome. The symptoms are very similar. And in that case, I would refer that patient to, uh, to her gynecologist uh, in order to assess the possibility of starting estrogen replacement therapy or not for that patient. Now, in this case, uh, nothing else, uh, not a, nothing uh, like this applied. I looked at her TFTs and uh, she had a TSH of 275, a uh, normal free T4, and a T3 that was uh, slightly lower. It was borderline lower for her. And what would be the, the recommendation? Either increase the dose of levothyroxine. We see that the discussion that we just had was previously, it was exactly on the spot, or replace a little bit of levothyroxine with some uh, T3. Now, these are the two patient, two papers that I mentioned from Mary Samuels, in which it says that this increasing levothyroxine by itself resolves some issues in some patients. It, it's not completely 100% effective, but that would be the first thought. Uh, because this patient was already on combination therapy and she felt well, uh, you know, it, for me, it would be more justified to start even without increasing the dose of levothyroxine, but just jumping into the combination therapy. But before we do that, what does the ATA say? What's the guidelines say? And I read that uh, I was part of this panel and this was a big discussion. And I will read it 
differently than what our colleague just read. So the ATA recommends against the routine, and the key word here is routine. That means that you, you, we don't recommend for patients with hypothyroidism to every patient that comes to your office, you start right off the bat with combination therapy. That's what it says here. If you don't do that, you're perfectly allowed and the, the, the guidelines don't recommend against the combination therapy for patients that don't feel well when they're placed on levothyroxine alone. So it's a very relaxed uh, guideline that changed from the past and is more in line with European guidelines exactly that says that you just give it a try. Uh, if you eliminated everything, you just give it a try, but don't do it for 100% of your patients. That, that's what it says here. Now, what do we know about thyroid hormone economy that applies for this discussion, especially for T3 levels? Well, you know, the thyroid produces both T4 and T3, and T3 is the biologically active thyroid hormone. T3 is taken up by cells, finds its way to the nucleus, binds to, to thyroid hormone receptors. These receptors are bound to genes, different sets of genes, and when T3 binds to the receptor, it changes the rate at which certain genes are expressed. And by changing the, uh, I call it the messenger and a footprint of the cell, uh, that explains the biological effects of thyroid hormone on development, growth, metabolism, cognition, and, and so on. So T3 is the key hormone that triggers thyroid hormone action. Now, both T4 and T3 are regulated through specific feedback mechanisms. And both at the hypothalamus level and the pituitary level, uh, these structures can uh, constantly monitor T3 levels in the circulation, and they can also monitor T4 levels in the circulation. The interesting thing is that for these structures to be able to monitor T4 levels in the circulation, they locally convert T4 to T3 in the hypothalamus and in the pituitary gland. So in the end, it's all T3, but it, the structures can distinguish between what's in the circulation uh, in terms of T4 and T3, thanks to the presence of these deiodinases that are placed here. The type 2 deiodinase is that allows the, the conversion, the local conversion of T4 to T3 in both the hypothalamus and pituitary gland. Now, uh, I, I'm telling you that we produce basically about 30 micrograms of T3 every day, but the thyroid produces very little, only five micrograms every day. It's because the rest, the bulk of T3 production occurs outside of the thyroid gland. There's the D2 pathway and there's the D1 pathway. These are two distinct deiodinases. And we believe that the D2 pathway is the most relevant one for humans. About two thirds of the T3 produced uh, daily, they come from the D2 pathway. The D1 pathway produces in normal individuals, we're not talking about hyperthyroidism, in normal individuals, the D1 pathway will produce as much as the thyroid gland does. What happens in this case is that T4 is taken up by the cell, finds D2, D2 produces T3, and the T3 exits the cell and mixes with the circulating pool of T3. And the same thing happens with the D1. Now, I'm telling you these deiodinases produce so much T3, they must be super critical for maintaining T3 levels in the circulation. In reality, they're not. So. Uh, what we did was we studied animals that lack D2, lack D1, or lack D1 and D2. And we looked at the T3 levels in the circulation and T4 levels in the circulation. And you see that uh, these are wild type animals, control animals. No matter what we do in terms of knocking out these enzymes, the T3 levels in the circulation remain normal. And so the only explanation is that the thyroid is compensating, is stepping up production of T3. And how do we think that's occurring? Well, it's because look, every time the deiodinase is knocked out, the T4 levels in the circulation go up, meaning that the price for the 
thyroid to maintain normal T3 levels by producing more T3 is to produce also increased amounts of T4. So the whole system ad adjusts itself, tolerates a high T4 in order to maintain T3 levels in the circulate. This is an extremely important concept that this, this unit, the hypothalamus pituitary unit, is geared, is, is hardwired to maintain and preserve T3 levels in the circulation. And it will tolerate a T4 being really high, it doesn't matter as long as the T3 is within the normal range. Now, what happens when we don't have a thyroid that's functioning anymore and we are treating our patients with levothyroxine? We've been told uh, for 50 years that well, it doesn't really matter. The diatonases will adjust themselves and they will compensate for the small amount of T3 that was being produced by the thyroid. And so that what we have to do is to, as we treat patients with levothyroxine, we don't even care about T3. It doesn't really matter. All we care is about TSH, maintaining a normal TSH. So, and the diatonases will do their job. So, in fact, that's not quite right. Uh, since very early in the transition from desiccated thyroid extract to levothyroxine alone, Jack Oppenheimer and Marty Sirks already shown that these patients are kept on levothyroxine only. They have a slightly lower T3 levels in the circulation. This is the normal uh, population. This is, you, you can see that they are significantly lower. And at the same time that they have a lower T3, they have a slightly higher T4 levels in the circulation. This is nothing different than we see with our patients that are treated with levothyroxine. Slightly high T4, slightly lower T3. Now, for some reason, this did not raise any red flags or yellow flags at that time. And people pushed forward without thinking, I guess, that this was not clinically relevant. Along the 50 years that passed, I looked at the studies that asked whether T3 was normal in the circulation in levothyroxine-treated patients. And the overwhelming majority of the studies depicted here in red stars, they show that indeed T3 levels are reduced in patients with levothyroxine treatment. Only a few studies, these depicted in green here, we're not able to find the difference. The end of this study is not really large. We're talking about here about 100 patients per study, except these two last studies that I'm going to talk more in details. This is a study by Gulo and collaborators in Italy. They looked at 2,000 thyroidectomized individuals on levothyroxine and compared those individuals with 4,000 normal individuals. And what they did was they, they matched these populations for TSH levels. So everybody here has the same level of TSH. And you can see that the patients on levothyroxine distributed here with this curve, they have a, the curve is shifted to the right. The normal range is the, the hashed uh, uh, range here. So you see the shift to the right, meaning they have relatively higher T4 levels and the T3 curve is shifted to the left. And even 15% of the individuals have below normal T3 levels in the circulation. Important, everybody here has normal TSH. We looked at the NHANES data. We looked at about 500 individuals in NHANES. And what we did, we, we created a control population that was matched for age, for sex, for ethnic background, and for TSH. And you see that as these two populations, T4 treated and matched controls have absolutely normal TSH, the T3 levels are slightly reduced and the T4 levels are slightly elevated, confirming what we, what Gulo saw and what we see in our practice as well. So, Dr. Bianco, can I interrupt you for a second? In these studies that showed this, was there any difference in terms of symptoms? What did oh, they no. say no, that the we have, no, we haven't looked at symptoms. Okay. And uh, I can tell you 
T3 levels in the circulation do not correlate with symptoms. We, there's not a single study that has shown that T3 levels in the circulation correlate with symptoms. And we think that the explanation for that, well, there, there are a lot of explanations, but there are two that are more important. Number one, if you're treating someone with T3, the T3 levels in the circulation fluctuate a lot and depends on what time of the day that you're looking at the T3 levels in order to, you would need to do an integrated 24 hour measurement as I'm gonna show you in a minute. The second reason is in the brain, uh, we, there are diadenases that, and, and so the T3 level in the circulation does not necessarily reflect the T3 levels in the brain. If you have a problem with the type two diadenase, for example, you can have perfectly normal T3 levels in the circulation, but the T3 levels in the brain will be reduced. Thank you. So, so what do we think is happening here? Well, this is the, the, the unit, the hypothalamus and the pituitary unit, and the feedback is maintaining TSH normal. As we treat our patients with levothyroxine and look at TSH, keeping a TSH within the normal range, what we end up doing is that uh, since there's slightly lower T3 levels, and slightly elevated T4 levels, that's what is keeping the TSH within the normal range. So we have a new equilibrium point here. Uh, yes, TSH is normal, but thanks to a slightly elevated T4 and a slightly reduced T3. I, I exaggerated here just to make a point, but we know that these changes are about 10% above and below. Now, why is that? Why, why cannot why can't we keep the T3 normal in the circulation at the same time that we, we keep the TSH normal? Well, let's look at these two processes. And it's interesting that the TSH feedback is mediated via the type 2 diadenase. And so I just told you that the most critical enzyme that produces T3 for humans is the type 2 diadenase. So it does not make sense that if we are talking about the same enzyme regulating both processes that they would be out of sync as we treat our patients with levothyroxine. Well, we looked into this a few years ago and what we saw is, is this. So when D2 converts T4 to T3, what happens is that D2 undergoes a process of inactivation. You lose D2 activity. D2 undergoes ubiquitination, which is a conjugation of D2 to a small protein, and that kills D2 activity. So this is a sort of a self-destructive mechanism that D2 has to prevent an excess of D3 production. So every time the price D2 has to pay to convert to produce T3 is to lose its activity and be degraded. So as we are treating our patients with levothyroxine, we start with the, they have low T4, D2 activity is very high. As we increase the dose of T4, we are increasingly losing D2 activity and relatively speaking, we make less and less T3 all the time. Now, what happens in the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland? That's not the case. So in the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, D2 converts T4 to T3 and the process of inactivation of D2 is not a very effective one. So D2 can continue converting T4 to T3 without losing its activity, without conjugation to ubiquitin and without destruction. That means that here in the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, production of T3 based on T4 deiodination is a very effective mechanism. And in the periphery, when we're talking about T3 that's being produced for the circulation, it's not so effective. And that difference explain well, that difference exists to make room for the T3 that's produced by the thyroid. Otherwise, it would not make sense to produce T3 by the thyroid. Since we don't have T3 production, the unbalance that's physiological remains, and that's why we normalize TSH before we normalize T3 in the circulation. There are other reasons why patients could present even further reductions in T3 levels in the circulation when they're treated with levothyroxine. Remember, 
When they're treated with levothyroxine, the only source of T3 is the iodination. Now, there is this uh, polymorphism that has uh, been studied in, in, in different populations in the type 2 deiodinase. And we found that uh, this enzyme, it's about 20% less active than the, the normal enzyme. Then when, when the, in the position 92, we have alanine as opposed to threonine, the enzyme produces about 20% less T3. Domenico Salvatore in Naples found that patients kept on levothyroxine that have this polymorphism, they do have slightly lower levels of T3. Recently, collaborating with Alexandra Dumitrescu and Sam Rafetov in, in, in my division, uh, we described the first two or three families that have a mutation in the type 1 deiodinase that actually kills almost uh, all D1 activity in these patients. Another reason why you would have uh, certain patients with a higher propensity of exhibiting lower levels of T3 as we treat them with levothyroxine. Now, the big question is, is this clinically relevant? Because I guess that's what people thought in the 70s. If you have a 10% lower T3, what's the big deal? How can we prove that this is doing something? So before we, we go there, what are the symptoms that we should be looking that we want to treat uh, with th improving the thyroid hormone replacement therapy? Now, this is a paper that was published in 1970. As patients were being, uh, tr treatment for hypothyroidism was transitioning from, from desiccated thyroid extract to levothyroxine. And uh, our colleague, uh, Selwyn Taylor, Taylor in London, notice that a very small group of patients with hypothyroidism are not entirely well on levothyroxine replacement alone. It is particularly for these that we have found that combination therapy, T4, T3 tablet is of value. So that that's for me is amazing because even before all the controversy started in 70, 1970, we already had a doctor that went on record and published that he noticed in his practice, what we all saw in our practices over time, that patients did not feel well when they were replaced with levothyroxine alone. It works for most patients, but some patients, a small number of patients, don't do well with levothyroxine alone. Now, nothing much was done uh, since this publication. I guess the push to put patients on levothyroxine and focus on TSH and not on symptoms was overwhelming. And pretty much 30 years have passed after this, in which a prompt by a psychologist in UK, a patient started writing to the British Thyroid Foundation, complaining that they were not feeling well. And you see all this, uh, this, uh, this is a, a publication in the British Thyroid Foundation bulletin. They would just say, first of all, doctors don't, are not paying attention to what we tell them. Uh, we are extremely happy to know that we are not alone. Other patients do feel very similarly as we do. And they just couldn't put a finger on what they were feeling. They were just saying that they did not feel normal at all. Uh, this was not, at the, in, you know, in 1996, there was no talk about brain fog or anything like that. They just did not feel well. Now, Colin Diane, which is a, an endocrinologist in Wales, he seized on those uh, letters from those patients. And he applied two different questionnaires, one a general health questionnaire and another one that he helped craft, which is thyroid symptom questionnaire. And these questionnaires ask a bunch of questions and the patients have to answer from one to four, uh, the higher the number, the more symptoms that they, it reflects. And uh, so look at the percentage of patients that responded levels three and level four in these two questionnaires. The lower number reflects control individuals. The higher number reflects individuals on levothyroxine. They were matched. Uh, they were, you know, Colin looked at the presence of chronic conditions. It, they were sort of matched, these two populations. And you can see that both in the general health questionnaire and the thyroid specific questionnaire, those individuals with levothyroxine, they're not doing uh, 
as well as the control individuals are. Now, Wilmar Versinga in Amsterdam, a few years later, not only confirmed those symptoms with questionnaires, but he also did a series of cognitive tests uh, in which they looked for uh, different types of memories, working memory, learning memory, general well-being, cognitive psychomotor speed, and invariably all of this is statistically significant worsen in patients that are taking levothyroxine as compared with the matched population. So in my mind, there is no question that patients on levothyroxine are not doing as well as control population. The question is, can we help these patients by changing or adjusting or improving replacement therapy? Now, more recently, we looked at uh, brain fog because the more and more patients complain of brain fog, they come with this expression. It has become a very fashionable expression uh, uh, that, that are brought to us by our patients. And we, we actually don't know what brain fog is. I, I looked at the different thyroid textbooks. This is not part of our uh, uh, questionnaires or re regular things that we ask our patients. What is brain fog? So we asked uh, in the, the online questionnaire about from patients that have hypothyroidism and feel uh, brain fog, what do they mean by that? And we had about 5,500 answers. Uh, so we, ha we see that these were categorized by uh, all the time, that's the, the specific symptom that's exhibited all the time, frequently, sometimes, and never. And you see that uh, low energy, low motivation is the top one, right? All the time and frequently in about 90% of the patients. And then we have mixed with this, we have cognitive symptoms and we have mood symptoms. But overall, uh, brain fog is a mixture of poor motivation with some cognitive impairment and mood impairment predominantly on poor motivation. Now, in this survey, we also had a field in which patients could write whatever they wanted to tell us about brain fog. And we uh, used the software to, to analyze this, uh, th their responses, because this was free text. They wrote a lot. And we noticed that uh, these patients could be, the, the answers could be uh, classified in symptoms focus or medically focus. And what, what does it mean? Well, the individuals that had answered that were symptom focused in their writing, they focus on their symptoms. That was the most, the highest concern that they had was the symptoms. Now, those individuals that were medically focused, they focus on three different things. First, on the poor relationship doctor-patient <clears throat> relationship. Second thing on the diagnose, they were obsessed with their diagnose. And the third thing, third group, they were obsessed with their medication. So this is exemplified here. Obviously, we're not going to read all this, but here we have the five groups that I described. And here we have a word clouds that uh, this is the result of the analysis of the survey. You see that patients that were concerned about their patient-doctor relationship, look what the words, they all write very similar words, doctor in the middle. The, the other group of patients, they were concerned about medications. So they talk about lyothyronine, levothyroxine, and so it's, it's completely different than this group. These are concerned with the disease, and these two are concerned with their cognitive symptoms. And I mean, it's hard to, to, to put a finger on what does that mean, but I think for, for us, it's important to understand that patients come to us with different concerns. And as we try to help these patients, it would be very important if we could try to find in that patient that's sitting in front of us, is this patient concerned with, with his or her symptoms? Or is this patient mostly concerned with the doctor relationship with patient, meaning they need someone that believe that they're not feeling well, because many patients tell me that 
doctors don't believe what they're saying, or this is a patient that is really obsessed with a little, small adjustments in the medication. Uh, and so by trying to categorize these patients in these five buckets, maybe we can help them uh, beyond what we think we can. Now, yes, not all patients, not all hypothyroid patients are fully recovered with treatment. And yes, they do have a cognitive component. Now, is there a metabolic component associated with this cognitive component? Because I, I think that even though we can explain, yeah, well, the T3 in the circulation doesn't correlate with the cognitive component because in the brain you have the diagnosis and most T3 produced in the brain doesn't come from the blood. Yeah, okay, but if the T3 is low and this is relevant, then they should have a metabolic component because the liver doesn't have type 2 diagnase, muscle doesn't have, so they should suffer from this low T3 in the circulation if this is in fact clinically relevant. So Chip Ridgeway and a, a, put a bunch of uh, other great folks at Mass General 40 years ago looked at this and what they did was they looked at a group of hypothyroid individuals in which they treated with uh, for four weeks with T3, 10 micrograms per day, then four weeks, 20 micrograms per day, and increased to 25 to 50 micrograms per day. And then lastly, what they did was they switched these patients to levothyroxine. And the T3 levels here, they measured multiple times during the day. So they had the integrated levels of T3 for each one of these patients. And what this, they saw, I find it remarkable. Look, these are the t integrated T3 levels in the circulation. These are the integrated TSH levels in the circulation. As they start with T3, uh, the 10 micrograms per day, one dose, is not, that brings T3 to the, not even to the lower limit of normal. Then they go up a little bit, 20, 25, only 50 micrograms per day is that brings the T3 levels close to the medium uh, range of what's expected to see T3. At the same time, uh, the T3 is, is increasing slowly, the TSH is dropping dramatically, right? But look at the last change. <clears throat> when these patients were changed from 50 micrograms of T3 per day to between 100 and 150 of levothyroxine, the TSH dropped almost to normal but the T3 levels also dropped as well, meaning that what I've been telling you, T4 is great to normalize TSH. T4 is not that great to produce and to keep T3 levels in the circulation within the normal range. Now, what do they measure in these patients? They looked at four different things. They look at basal metabolic rate. They look at serum cholesterol, CPK, which is at that time a surrogate for thyroid hormone status in skeletal muscle. And they have they looked at the heart, the systolic time intervals, which are very sensitive to thyroid hormone levels. Now, looked at the basal metabolic rate. Was very low in the hypothyroid state. The normal is at, from minus 10 to plus 10. It normalizes with T3. So that, that was good. T3 was able to normalize the basal metabolic rate. Look at the cholesterol, very high, 352. And with T3, even though the basal metabolic rate was normalized, cholesterol was reduced, but never below 200 milligrams per DL. CPK was normalized right off the bat. Normal CPK, normal systolic, systolic time intervals. That already tells you that probably the liver uh, sees this T3 in the circulation is slightly different than the heart because the, T the cholesterol was never normal in these patients. Now, look what happens when they switch the patients to levothyroxine. The basal metabolic rate dropped below the normal range. Look, even though the TSH is normal, the T3 dropped and the basal metabolic rate dropped as well. The cholesterol stayed above 200 and the CPK and the systolic time intervals, they were not affected. So that, for me, tells me that different tissues react differently to thyroid hormone. 
And when we, we give levothyroxine, the T3 seems to be able to normalize most, but you know, 50 micrograms of T3 per day does not normalize TSH. If you normalize TSH with T4, then different tissues start to suffer and exhibit signs of hypothyroidism, mostly cholesterol and a basal metabolic rate. Now, let's focus on cholesterol. Uh, a few studies have shown that patients on levothyroxine have slightly increased levels of cholesterol. Ito in Japan uh, study individuals before and after thyroidectomy and after thyroidectomy, they had normal TSH on levothyroxine. He saw that uh, LDL and cholesterol is slightly elevated. Then Li in China, uh, actually, I think it's Korea, they, had, uh, they studied 1,000 individuals and they saw the same thing. If you're on levothyroxine before and, and after, after you were placed on levothyroxine, your levels of cholesterol is slightly elevated. We did a, a meta-analysis. We looked at a bunch of studies and uh, we confirmed that in fact, levels of cholesterol are slightly elevated. Even though you have normal TSH, patients do have slightly elevated levels of cholesterol. Now, prompt by that, uh, and because these studies did not take into account the utilization of statin, because you know if a patient has high cholesterol, the, the, immediately we're going to place that patient on statin. So what happens with statin utilization in patients that are using levothyroxine? So we looked at about, uh, re, this is a retrospective study of about 11,000 patients at the University of Chicago. Oh, they were following regular visits uh, and we looked at them. They had uh, three years of regular visits before they were placed on levothyroxine, and then they had three years of regular visits after they were placed on levothyroxine. And we saw that <clears throat> indeed, <clears throat> when they, after they were placed on levothyroxine, the utilization of statin has increased. Increased, uh, you know, before, stat, before levothyroxine, about out of 11,000, we had maybe 1,500 on statin after the index encounter where they were placed on levothyroxine, that number reaches almost 2,000. So there was an increase in the, the utilization of statin. Not only that, the strength of the statin treatment increased as well. So uh, now, when did, were, were these patients placed on statin? So in the, after the index encounter, we have year one, year two, year three. We saw that these patients were placed on statin. In fact, not immediately after they were placed on levothyroxine, but almost a year, more than a year, between one and two years after they were placed on levothyroxine is that the, the prescription for statin uh, shows up in the medical record. At that time, we also had TSH. And obviously, the question is, are these patients thyroid did they normalize the TSH? Yes, indeed. Uh, this is a group of uh, a subgroup of uh, 3,500 individuals that have normal TSH, and even with the normal TSH, between one and two years after they are placed on levothyroxine, they are started on statin. So there's a, a, a likelihood that we, we did all the calculations and there's the odds ratio of being on statin if you are on levothyroxine is about 1.5 to 2. And in addition, based on the enhanced data, <clears throat> we know that these patients on levothyroxine, compared with the matched control population, they weigh about 10 pounds more just by being on levothyroxine. And as I said, the cholesterol levels are slightly elevated, even considering that they are much more likely to be on statin treatment. Now, <clears throat> We explore further that concept that different tissues uh, respond differently to therapy with levothyroxine. So here's where we made a mouse. <clears throat> and this mouse, uh, it's a transgenic mouse. It means that there's an extra gene that was, it's not a natural gene. We put that gene in that mouse. Every cell that that mouse has this gene, this gene, is a luciferase gene reporter. 
that is regulated by three thyroid hormone responsive elements, meaning that this gene is super sensitive to T3. When T3 interacts with these thyroid hormone receptors here, <clears throat> the luciferase gene goes up and we can easily measure in different tissues. So we know the status of the thyroid status of every tissue of this mouse just by looking at the luciferase gene report. <clears throat> what we did with these mice was we have here control mice and we have T3 levels and T4 levels. Then we made them hypothyroid. You see that the T4 levels and T3 levels go down dramatically. Then we gave them T4 in two different doses, 1.7 and 1.85 micrograms per, per, per mouse per day. And we created a situation in which T4 levels are higher than normal and T3 levels are lower than normal, which is exactly the situation we want to investigate. These patients on levothyroxine, they have slightly elevated T4, slightly reduced T3. And then we looked at the luciferase gene, this gene reporter, in different parts of the brain. See, this is the striatum, which is an area of the brain that's involved with motivation. So it could be potentially related to patients being feeling tired. Now, this is the normal expression of the luciferase gene around one. Then in the hypothyroid group of mice, the, the re reported gene decreases dramatically, which is compatible with what I'm telling you. Now, when we gave them T4, you see it, the expression of the reported gene goes back to normal. But when we increased further the T4 dose, it didn't change much. So striatum responded to T4, but when we gave more T4, it didn't respond at all remain at the good level. Now, look at the cerebellum, a different part of the brain, also decreased in hypothyroidism, but neither dose of T4, neither one of them, was able to normalize thyroid hormone signaling in the cerebellum. The striatum was already normal. The cerebellum remained slightly hypothyroid below the control levels. Another part of the brain, the, the cortex, look, reduction in hypothyroidism, normalization with T4, and the cortex, yes, it responds to an extra boost of T4. So when we increase the dose of T4 in these animals, the cortex, the cortex responded and it became slightly thyrotoxic. So finally, we have the hippocampus, which behaved similarly to the cortex. Also decreased in hypo, normalized with T4, but became a slightly thyrotoxic with a higher dose of T4. So that tells us that we're not even talking about different organs. We're talking about different parts of the brain. They respond differently to T4 and to increasing doses of T4. Striatum responds one way, cerebellum a different way, and cortex and hippocampus tend to respond in a similar way as we see here. <clears throat> oh. Again, I just want to stress this point, which is really important. Before assuming that treatment with levothyroxine failed in our offices with our patients, you just ask yourself these questions. And I think that we already uh, talked about it. Is there a solid diagnosis of hypothyroidism? Can we exclude all these bunch of other conditions that can cause similar symptoms? If you are satisfied that you eliminated all possibilities, what do you do? If you want to put someone on combination therapy, how is this done? Well, basically, you have to do on a patient by patient by patient basis. There's no magic formula that will apply for everyone. A good starting point is a reduction of 25 micrograms of levothyroxine and introduction of some T3, perhaps uh, five micrograms, 10 micrograms, I'm gonna show you what happens. And then you need to follow that patient with an enhanced follow-up. So you're not gonna put someone on T3 and say, go, go, good luck, come back in a year. No, you're gonna follow that patient in, in a regular intervals, depending on how busy your clinic is, but at, at least once every three or four months to make sure that everything is okay. 
you're not going to do this. You're going to avoid doing that in older patients, patients that have cardiac conditions or other conditions that could be uh, make them particularly sensitive to the T3 in the circulation. Now, when choosing the dose of T3, uh, here are some studies by Francesco Celli in which he modeled this is what would happen in a patient that's taking levothyroxine, and we added to the regimen of levothyroxine 3.25 micrograms of T3 twice daily, morning and afternoon. And, and the, the black bars here are just the normal range. You see that 3.25 increases T3 in the circulation, and it's far away from the upper limit of normal. Now, this is by five, with five micrograms of T3 twice a day. So you see that it, it, the, the, the changes are a little bit more intense, but still far away from the upper limit of normal. If you do 10 micrograms twice a day, then you start, you touched the upper limit of normal. So uh, it's really up to, to, to you and the titrating these doses with your patient. But I, I think that a good uh, point is to be between five micrograms twice a day or, or 7.5 micrograms twice a day. And the most important thing, of course, is making sure the TSH levels remain within normal range. Now, finally, I'm getting to the end. Uh, what do we know about the clinical trials? Because this is not news. I mean, people have been doing clinical trials with combination therapy for 30 years. The, combination, the, the trials show that treatment with levothyroxine and combination therapy, these are equivalent treatments. One is not better than the other when we looked at the whole population of patients with hypothyroidism. So that's an important thing. So People tend to stress on the fact that combination therapy is not superior to levothyroxine, but levothyroxine is also not superior to combination therapy. That's an important point. Second point is there's a clear preference for combination therapy. Patients do prefer combination therapy. And this is uh, uh, what came from uh, the, a series of clinical trials that have been shown uh, even though that preference is not captured on those uh, questionnaires that the patients are offered, but the, when they ask which treatment did you prefer, A or B, because they're blinded, they don't know what it is, they do prefer combination therapy, which I think it's a very important point. We have, for some reason in the guidelines, have not considered preference as a strong uh, reason for treating patients with combination therapy, which is, for me, is kind of uh, surprising. Now, what did the, the statements from the American Thyroid Association, British Thyroid Association, and the European Thyroid Association uh, says, which was just published a few months ago? Well, yeah, after 50 years of looking at these trials, we concluded that the randomized controlled trials comparing this therapies did not specifically recruit patients with attention to persistent hypothyroid symptoms. Yeah, we know that they are a minority, and yet they're mixed with a bunch of other patients that feel very well on levothyroxine. So if you have 10 patients that don't feel well on levothyroxine mixed up with 90 patients that do feel well, whatever those 10 patients do when you change them for combination therapy, it's going to be diluted in the whole ocean of patients that do feel well. So it's recommended, these three societies recommended that future trials need to focus on those patients that don't feel well and they did not benefit from, from therapy with levothyroxine. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna show you the uh, this study which was just published a couple of weeks ago in the JCNM by the group from Walter Reed uh, Medical Center in, in Bethesda by Dr. Shakir and Hong. This is a new study that they did, was just published a couple of weeks ago. They looked at 90 patients with hypothyroidism that were randomized for three different treatments, 
these are double blind placebo controlled uh, crossover study. They were either on levothyroxine, DTE, desiccated thyroid extract, or combination therapy for 16 weeks at a time. So every time they were on, on these different treatments, they remained for four months. Now, and then they were assessed during all this time. During all this time, their TSH, PSH of the patients remained within the normal range. So no matter what, the, they titrated all the doses to keep the TSH within the normal range. So I'm going to show you one result, which I think is very telling, very impressive. This is the thyroid symptom questionnaire. And the higher you have, the higher your score in this questionnaire, the more symptoms you have. So it's bad to have high levels here. So we, we split the population in three thirds. First, the ones that have almost no symptoms, the ones that have medium symptoms, and the ones that have a lot of symptoms. So these are the three subgroups that were created out of those 90 individuals. And then we crossed these results, we plotted these results with the delta that occurred uh, when they migrated from levothyroxine to combination therapy. So, in other words, these individuals had no symptoms to start with when they were on levothyroxine. What happens when we change them to combination therapy? Well, when we change them to combination therapy, the symptoms increased slightly, but not statistically significant. So basically, they remained the same. So they had low symptoms to start with, they were changed to combination therapy, and they remained basically the same. Now, the other group had more symptoms, still not, not the highest symptoms, but some symptoms. And when we changed them to combination therapy, they sort of uh, reduced slightly they had less symptoms. And then when these individuals that have the most symptoms on levothyroxine exhibited a dramatic decrease in the number of symptoms after they were switched to combination therapy. So that confirms the notion that, number one, most patients do very well on levothyroxine. Uh, you know, this data is telling us that Two thirds of the patients at least do very well on levothyroxine. Just a minority of the patients that don't feel well on levothyroxine. And in this particular study, uh, they responded very well to a combination therapy. They reduced their symptoms in this questionnaire. I mean, uh, Shakir and Hong, they did a series of other studies. You know, you should go and look at the publication. But they basically show that cognition follows the same pattern, meaning that most patients do very well on levothyroxine, but some patients don't do very well, and they responded to combination therapy. Now, our challenge for our practices is to identify these individuals, and that's why so far the, the guidelines tell you you have to do a trial because it it, it is possible that your patient is going to respond to combination therapy favorably. In this study, they did. But it's also possible that those symptoms that you're looking at are not originally caused by any disruption in thyroid hormone si si uh, signaling because most patients do very well on levothyroxine alone. And if, if you have uh, uh, other conditions that could explain that, those should be explored and looked at in carefully. So that was the lecture. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Bianco. Uh, I think your talk is going to be one of the most watched talks on our YouTube channel when the recording is posted there. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask the group as to after hearing Dr. Bianco, would you do anything different in the case that was presented? Please feel free to type it in the 
uh, chat box so that we can see how people would do differently. Um, in the meantime, I also want to ask you a question which is in the chat. Uh, do you measure total T3 or free T3 only? And when do you ask patients to have the blood work done in relation to taking the medication? So I think the free T3 is less reliable than total T3. Uh, I, I never order free T3 at all. Uh, I go with total T3. And when do you measure T3? Uh, you should measure uh, before in fasting before patients take any tablets in the morning. And if you want to know if the dose you're giving of T3 is uh, what's the maximum fluctuation that the patient will exhibit, you have to measure again three hours after patients took the tablet of T3, between two and three hours. It doesn't have to be you know, on the, the very accurate, but between two and three hours after they took the tablet. So I would do fasting and then I would do two or three hours after they took the tablet of cytomel. Thank you. Or, or uh, desiccated thyroid extract would be the same thing. Dr. Baguera. Antonio, uh, thank you. Obrigado. It was, uh, was great. Um, let me ask you about depression and replacement with, with T3. Uh, you were talking about sense of well-being, but but what about fluoride depression that sometimes patients really request and, and, and the, the, the addition of T3? Yes, so depression is, is one of the symptoms, it's not the predominant symptom. I mean, this is what we see in a lot of the questionnaires. Uh, depression can occur, but it's not the predominant symptoms that people complain. Now, depression is so common in our society today that and hypothyroidism is so common that you do have a combination of both. And it is, in fact, that there's a vast literature from the psychiatry world in which patients don't re with hypothyroidism don't respond well uh, to antidepressive therapy. And in, and in those cases, they tend to overshoot with replacement therapy. So I had a few patients in which uh, the only way that patient could be out of depression was to keep the TSH suppressed with levothyroxine. I don't have experience with adding T3, but I know psychiatrists do, and uh, it's sort of a, one way to maximize the effects of the antidepressive. I think that if you want to do this for two or three, four months for a time period, uh, in which you're going to save that patient from suicide. It's better to have a suppressed DSH and lose some bone and not to, to have suicide. But long-term strategy for that, it's complicated because uh, I think that it's hard. I mean, you're going to keep that patient thyroid toxic for a long time. You have to, to see it on a case by case. But it is true. Some patients only respond to antidepressive therapy if they're thyroid toxic. I can add to it. I have actually one patient who was absolutely depressed. She wanted every therapy, couldn't hold the job, couldn't live alone, couldn't do nothing. She came with her own volition and asking me if I would consider adding. And I did add some T3. I can't remember exact dose right now. It's been years now. And uh, her TSH was suppressed, but not completely. It was still around 0 0.1. So I feel kind of comfortable. She is still depressed, but now she has a boyfriend and can keep the job. Yes. So I, we all have patients like that. Exactly. Right. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Is it sufficient to give T3 once daily instead of twice daily? Uh, uh, I, I think so. I think yes. However, uh, this most recent studies from uh, Francesco Celli uh, made me change my mind. I think that the fact that the even giving twice a day does not cause that patient to exhibit T3 above the normal range and keeping a normal TSH. I would, uh, you know, uh, my tendency is to, to use twice a day if the patient can tolerate. Some patients will forget. I mean, that some patients, that's, that's why I think trying to identify who your patient is and what's his or her most but biggest concern is important because for those patients that are obsessed with their medication, 
it's okay to give it twice a day because they will not skip. Some patients are not so concerned with the medication. They're more concerned in having someone that listened to their complaint. And I think that that's a, a different thing. But I would favor giving T3 twice a day. Thank you. Uh, we have another one in the chat. The most recent trial that you presented, patients responding to the sudden increase in T3 levels, was this response sustained? Because some of the older trials, and this is our fellow Dr. Borgen who presented, so he did the lit review as well for the case, where some of the older trials show a response at three months, which was not sustained over 12 months. Right. I mean, there is a very strong placebo effect on all of these things. But that's why that trial, it was double-blinded, right? I mean, the, they looked at the patients four months at a time. The whole study took a year. Uh, they, you know, the trial stopped after they, after four months, they were switched to a different medication. So the trial was not meant to look at long-term res response, if it was sustained or not, just for those four months. Uh, but because it was double-blinded, the placebo effect is probably minimized. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nasser did answer, uh, you know, I asked if, if what is the thought on the clinical vignette after your presentation. And for those of you who don't have access to the chat, uh, Dr. Nasser did answer that increasing the dose of uh, levothyroxine in the patient to bring the TSH from 2.7 to 1 will uh, not make a difference to her symptoms. And he was interested in seeing further of the literature. So I think I can honestly say this discussion continues Although, Dr. Bianco, after your talk, we might be moving more towards adding T3 sooner rather than necessarily pushing for uh, liver thyroxin to be increased first. Um, going on, we have Dr. Mehra. Dr. Mehra, you have a question or comment? Thank you. That was an absolutely brilliant talk. It was wonderful. Uh, I'm interested in your uh, cont contention about TSH. We know that T3 will tend to suppress TSH somewhat more effectively than T4. And when you measure T4 and T3 levels, when you've got patients on, on T3, the T4 is usually running in the low normal range, somewhere between in, in the low normal range. And the T3, if, take, if taken in the morning, it tends to be low before the pill, and then if you take it about three hours after the pill, it tends to be in the mid-normal range. Mm -hmm. Your contention that that suppressed the SH with normal thyroid indices could predispose to osteoporosis is somewhat bothersome. It seems to me that when you use T3, especially if you use it twice a day, you will tend to get a relatively low TSH most of the time. And so if you try and target a TSH, in a range that is normal, most of the time, in my experience anyway, the patient feels pretty crappy. Mm -hmm. So I wondered whether the TSH, as far as I know, low TSH is not the reason for osteoporosis. High T4 is the reason. So what do you think? <clears throat> well, the, I, I go back to the original studies by Clark Swallowing uh, maybe 30 years ago in, he, in which he published in New England Journal of Medicine showing that a low TSH will lead to increased uh, incidence of atrial fibrillation, number one. Uh, and since the original study, atrial fibrillation has been documented uh, to correlate with TSH. Uh, I, I'm sure with 3T4 as well, but I think that TSH is the most reliable index for uh, risk of atrial fibrillation. Now, it's the index, but it's not the mediator. The mediator oh, no. is not TSH. The mediator is the circulating thyroid hormone. Oh, I'm sure, of course. No, but when you look at the, the, the occurrence of atrial fibrillation, uh, let's say you have a 1.5% in the general population. If you have a low TSH, that goes to 3 or 4%. So you increase... The, the likelihood that that patient could have an atrial fibrillation. That's number one. There are a series of studies showing that as you suppress the TSH, you accelerate bone turnover as well. So uh, 
I think there's some studies showing that you have increased fracture risk, uh, but those are now long-term effects. Those are not as concerning as atrial fibrillation. Uh, it's, but again, I agree with you. It's not the TSH. The TSH is just telling us what's happening. So I think to it might very well be that in the end, to make these patients happy, we have to have a suppressed TSH. But I, I'm not ready to say that. And I think we don't have studies showing that. Uh, I think that more clinical trials are needed for that. Thank you. Uh, we have a question coming in. Uh, this is Dr. Janet Lering from UPMC. She's asking, how do we escalate the, how do you de-escalate these patients as they get older? Hmm, that's a that's a great question. Uh, again, I would focus on the TSH, uh, knowing that as you get older, the TSH should slightly go up. And I would, uh, you know, again, make sure that those patients uh, have a, uh, a healthy cardiovascular system, and I would check the bone mineral density and bone metabolism more frequently. Uh, but I think conversation with the patient explaining that they, it's not probably not a good idea to be 95 and be taking cytomel uh, uh, 20 micrograms twice a day. So you need to, to go on a patient by patient basis and explain uh, the, why we have to do things. Dr. Bianco, do you have a cutoff for age where you prefer not to start cytomel or not to continue cytomel? Do you have a cutoff like that? I think 65 is the cutoff that the, the Medicare uses, for example, to tell us that uh, desiccated thyroid extract is a high risk medication if you're older than 65. There's not a lot of reason for that. But I think that 65 is is a good age for me. Uh, I I would I would think really hard before placing anyone older than 65 on lyothyronine. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a comment. I believe this is Dr. Lashin who's talking about the GI symptoms from the clinical vignette, and he's saying that maybe trying a lactose-free diet might improve, and he has seen association with the lactose-free diet and. Uh, uh, autoimmune thyroid disease where uh, patients do improve with that. I kind of agree that often a lot of GI symptoms do improve with changes in diet, and that might be the answer for that particular patient. Um, any other questions? I know we are uh, over time, but it was such an interesting topic. This is evidence of that, that we are still talking at 841. Anybody else? Uh, Dr. Gupta, go ahead if you have a question or a comment. Please unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, ha I have just a question about T4 reaction on the cell membrane receptor on beta integrin, which is actually been pretty well recognized to affect this cancer cell growth. So what that action may have some effect, you know, which you see, you know, metabolic symptoms or other things. You know, I wonder about that. The LT4 treatment alone may have some more effect. That could be, although the effects that we see uh, on T4 interacting with integrin in the cell membrane require higher doses of T4. Uh, it, we, I think, uh, unless I'm mistaken, the levels of T4 that trigger those integrin mediated uh, signaling it requires much more T4. It's more of a pharma, pharmacological dose of T4 than the levels we see in our patients. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't believe we have any more questions or comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Bianco. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk. I would also like to thank Dr. Chris Nasser who um, brought forward your name as an invitee for the um, for the EMI Live Grand Rounds, and we hope we will hear more from you in the future as this field develops. Okay. Thank you so much again.
Thank uh, you. I would like to remind everyone, we have our next session for EMI live on August 18th, and we have Dr. Lewis Plevins, another stalwart of endocrinology from UCSF, talking about hypercortisolism. We'll also have a clinical case prior to that presented by a second year fellow. Um, and I hope all of you will be able to join in. Have a wonderful day and thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.